Spirit, we welcome you into this place. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we glorify, magnify, and honor your holy name. Lord, may every care, every concern, every problem, every stress melt away at the mention of your holy name. Lord, I come before you this day confessing that I'm nothing, Lord, but you. You're everything. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Jehovah Nisi, our banner. Lord, you are my all in all, the refuge from every storm that I face. The hiding place, Lord, when I'm overwhelmed. God, you are everything that I need. Lord, my my prayer this morning is that you would have your way in this place. Make ready every heart, every mind, and spirit, Lord, to receive of you this holy, precious word, the bread of life. As your servant, Lord, I humbly confess again this day, and I acknowledge publicly, I am nothing. Lord, apart from you, there's nothing I can do. You are my strength and the very breath that I breathe. Use me however you see fit as a tool in your hand. May it all be for your glory. Let it be your word that goes forth today and not the word of a man. And I pray that you and you alone are seen and glorified in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Wow. God has really been very thick, very real. The atmosphere this morning has been very beautiful. The presence of God in both services. I want to, before I get into the message this morning, I want to read those core commitments that I shared with you last week. I want to read them again to you this morning. And before I do, I, I want to preface again, as I told you I would, that a commitment is not a casual endeavor. A, a commitment is not something that you take lightly. It's not something that you do if you have time. A commitment is something that you make time for. A commitment is something that, by its very nature, commands attention and a, a place of priority. If you're committed to your job, you go when you don't feel like it. You go when traffic is bad. You, you wait and you endure if you're committed to being a, a good father, then you're going to spend time with your kids instead of spending time on your hobbies and on your own self. A commitment is not something that is casual, quite the contrary. A commitment is just that. It's, it's saying this is a priority. And so these three are core commitments for the church and as individuals that God has hung a promise on. The first is a commitment to the Word. And, and I want to ask you as a church body, partner with us. Make a commitment personally to God to, to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to know the Word of God. Push through all the excuses that you may have that I don't understand or I don't have time. I don't know where to begin. Pick a place and roll with it. You can start at the beginning and work your way all the way to the end. Pick a book, start there. At a bare minimum, why don't you pick the, you got one of those that has the words of Jesus in red. Read all the red stuff. Truthfully, if you just read the words of Jesus Christ, it would be revolutionary in your life. It would be transformational, and it would probably only take you a, a couple to a few hours to read that. I'll give you a little hint. Anything before Matthew shouldn't have red letters in it. Make a commitment to the Bible. Make a commitment not only to read it, but to do it. James tells us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Begin to apply the word of God. And, and literally what that means is, is you hear something preached that's in this word, then begin to shift your life to line up with the word of God. Do what the word says. See if God's not good. Taste and see the Lord that he's not good. Apply the word of God. If you read something in there that convicts your heart, apply it to your life. Do it. Obey the word of God. So the commitment to the word is to read it, to study it, to hide it in our heart, and to do the Word of God, and also to share it. 
Share that word with somebody else. You may not know Scripture well yet, but if you get in this, you will. In the meantime, that doesn't let you off the hook. Tell them Jesus. That name you just sang about, Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Tell that word. The second is a commitment to discipleship, personal growth. Look for opportunities that you can grow and develop in your relationship with God. Look for opportunities. Make a commitment to seek out opportunities. To be a part of opportunities where you can grow in your relationship with God, in your knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Word. We have Sunday school classes that go on during both services. It's an opportunity for you to grow. We do that for you. We have Wednesday night Bible study. This is an opportunity for you to get in the Word of God. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's an opportunity to Break down the Word of God to, to learn it on a deeper level, to continue to grow. There's opportunity for you to watch other things on television, to listen to other things in your car radio, but you need to seek out opportunity. Make a commitment to discipleship. Most of us will look for opportunity, seek out opportunity in our job for advancement, for growth, for development. You want a promotion, it's amazing to me that, that we'll go to some extra training. We'll work a little bit later. We'll, we'll do whatever we can. We're committed to seeing that through. Make a commitment to the Word of God. Make a commitment to discipleship. Look for opportunities that you can grow in God. And the third is a commitment to serve. Jesus, being our example, served as he washed the disciples' feet. But not only that, served as he took up the cross and marched to Calvary's hill. cross is a symbol of a burden. It's not always easy. It's not fun. It is work. But make a commitment to serve God. God has uniquely gifted, called, and qualified you. God's called you to be something that I'm not. This body is the body of Christ, and he's called each of us to be members in that body, members in particular, the Bible says. And God has placed every member exactly where he wants it. You have a job to do, and one day you'll stand before God and give an account only to God. And it's really not an excuse to say, well, I don't know what to do, then do something. I'm glad that my lungs have never once said, I don't know what to do, because I'd be helpless. I wouldn't be able to tell them what to do either. I've never been a lung. Do something. And you'll find that as you begin to do something for the glory of God, that God will begin to develop the gift inside of you. God will begin to reveal who He's called and created you to be. You want to know how I became a pastor? Don't let this scare you. I had a pastor at 19 years old, sat across the dinner table from one evening after church. He said, what do you think about teaching a Sunday school class? That had to be a God thing because I was 19, could barely read, but man, I was excited. But I stunk at teaching Sunday school class. I was a horrible teacher. But go figure. Now, now I mean, back then it didn't, didn't feel that good that I was learning. It wouldn't have mattered. I wanted to quit. I had no idea that God was developing. I had no idea that God had called me to something beyond that. It was an opportunity to do something for God. And it was there that God began to grow, God began to nurture, God began to develop. It's not the preacher's job to tell you what you're called to do. God's already created you for something. Do something. Make a commitment to serve. Amen? Praise the Lord. This morning I want to preach on a commitment to discipleship. Coming back to the basics here. I wanted to lead us in with this thought process, if you will. In this culture, most of us have grown accustomed to love a bargain, love a deal, to bargain shop, garage sales, classified ads. You can go online and find things on sale. People will wait around, not me, but some folks will wait around for Black Friday deals. You can, you can have them. You can have mine too. Tell them that when you get there. Pastor Mark said he was sleeping in this morning. I could have his deal too. We'll wait for... That tax sale, the, uh, the, the, the tax-free weekend or whatever it's called, we'll look for any opportunity where we can get 
the most with the least amount of investment. It's amazing to me that many times we have this same mindset when it comes to spiritual things. You pray for your pastor this morning. God has been very heavy on my heart today in a good way. But I believe that God is, has a transformational word, really a powerful word this morning. If you will let the Holy Spirit speak to you, I pray in the name of Jesus that there not be anything that would hinder or distract you today. Let, let me ask you a favor. I feel this in my spirit this morning. If there's something, you've you got to get up and move around. If you feel like you might be a distraction this morning, ease out the door. They've they got it on the screen, but, but don't allow the enemy to use you to distract somebody else this morning. I'm going to ask you that. For those of you who have been with me, I don't do this. I don't think I've ever done that before. But I know that God's got a word this morning. Too many of us apply this bargain shopper mentality to the spiritual things. We want the most that we can get from God with the least amount of investment. We want the blessings of God, all the full benefits of God. We just don't want to commit to God. And what I want to preach to you about this morning is a, a commitment to discipleship. I've learned through the years that, that sometimes, and some of you probably have similar experiences, that, that I've got what I thought was a great deal, only to realize I got junk. I got it at a bargain price, but it wasn't a good deal at all. Like Daddy used to say, he said, something seems too, be good, too good to be true, it probably is. I've discovered while that's not always the case, there's a lot of truth in that statement. I've got things before and I thought, man, this was fantastic. And then had to spend more money in it trying to make it right or to fix it. Or stuck with something that wasn't right after all. Reminded me of a, a story that I had heard. I heard a, this lady that was moving to a new town. And so just as she got ready to close in her house, she decided to do what most of us would do. She wanted to ride through the, through the little town and kind of get familiar with it. And she rode by uh, this one store. It was a, a beauty salon, and it said, haircuts, $7. And she began to think to herself, she said, my goodness, who can compete with a $7 haircut? She gets a couple blocks further down the road there on Main Street, and she sees another huge banner out on the side of this building. It said, we fix $7 haircuts. <laughs> Spiritually, sometimes we can't figure out the mess that we're in. When we've tried to barter and bargain with God in our spiritual walk with God, We've tried to settle for less than what God really has for us. We, we want everything we can get from God without any investment or at least as little investment as possible. Let me be honest. Most of us don't pray like we ought to. But you let something happen and we want to barter with God. Oh, God, I'll, I'll do better. Lord, you, you know I'll start coming to church. God, I just need you to touch this. God, I, I need you to heal my child. God, I, I need you to intervene in my marriage. I'm so thankful that God didn't barter with me. I, I think about, I'm just visual, I think about the image of Christ maybe standing at the foot of the cross at Calvary, not, not nailed to it, and, and nobody's leading him there, and he's saying, Mark, you know what? I don't want you to die and go to hell. i tell you what I'll do. If you'll do X, Y, and Z, I'll, I'll let them nail me to that cross, and I'll die for you. I think if, if I stood face to face with Jesus and heard it that way and he, he, he laid out the reality of the consequences of my sin that I'd sign up for that deal all day long. I think it would, it would break my spirit. I'd buckle to my knees thinking, why would you do this for me? But if there's no other way, then God, I, I want salvation. And I will live for you. Well, if you know that today, then why don't you live for him today? The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? It, it means he didn't want to barter or negotiate with you. He didn't barter with the devil over your soul. He didn't barter with the world over your eternity. No, he came with no bargaining he came and he died on the cross for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. He went to take back 
the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So I'm quite confident he's not interested in bartering today. But many of us, we, we want everything that God will give as long as it doesn't cost us much. And I'm talking about discipleship this morning. You know what the word discipleship means? It means to be a student, a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of you may be surprised to know this, but the word disciple is mentioned in the New Testament over 260 times, whereas the word Christian is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. When it's mentioned in the first time in the book of Acts chapter 11, it says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples were called Christians. Let me, let me tell you this. This commitment to discipleship, I want to be very clear, using the biblical terminology. Discipleship means you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you are a Christian. But if you call yourself a Christian and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you are no Christian. The word Christian and disciple are synonymous. They are one and the same. It's like me saying my wife or my spouse. I'm saying the same thing, aren't I? If you call yourself a Christian but you're not following Jesus Christ, you are no Christian. If you call yourself a Christian but you are not a disciple, you are not a Christian. Jesus said, if you won't take up your cross and follow me, you are not my disciple. If I were to put it in a different term, if you will not take up your cross and follow after me, you are not a Christian. Holy Spirit, speak this morning. I believe that God is calling us to a, a reality call, a wake-up call. To confront the status of our life today. He's calling us to be the church. Calling us to be the Christians that he died to make us Christian. Means a Christ-like person. A Christ follower. What are you getting at, Pastor? You can't be a Christian who's not interested in being a disciple. There's something wrong with a person who's interested in church on Sunday morning, but not actually interested in following Jesus Christ. Now, only God's the judge. But I'd give long pause here to consider the state of my heart if I'm not interested in following after Jesus because of what it might cost me. He's not looking for fans. He's looking for committed followers. Turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 14. As you're turning there, I want to I want to take you back to a moment in your life. If you've made the commitment to surrender your life to Jesus or made a commitment to Jesus being the Lord of your life, I want to flash you back to that moment. Did you mean it? Whether it was at an altar on a Sunday morning, whether it was in your car on a Tuesday afternoon, whether it was at youth camp when you were a child, wherever it may have been, whenever it may have been, whether you were 8 years old or 48 years old, when you made that commitment, did you mean it? Were you serious when you told God that, that you would surrender your life to His? So I think for most of us that we are sincere, we are genuine. And we start out with the best of intentions, but, but then life happens, and it's easy to get sidetracked. And I've discovered that, that sometimes if you're not intentional, sometimes if, if you don't continue to make something a commitment and a priority in your life, it can just get lost in the shuffle of life. You can just get distracted by the busyness of this world. I've seen men who genuinely love their wife, who genuinely love their children, wind up in divorce court because they allowed life to 
so occupy and consume their time that they took for granted the relationship they had. Their career took them in another path. And they no longer made their family a commitment. And one day they realized they no longer have a relationship. You meant what you said to Jesus Christ. And I want you to remember the commitment you made. Luke chapter 14. Begin with verse 16. Let me say this. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without following Jesus. Does that sound simple enough? Say, duh. You can't be a follower of Jesus without following him. Let me tell you what Jesus said, though. We're getting to Luke. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I command? Why, Why do you call me Lord? When I'm not your Lord. Why do you say that you're a follower of mine when you don't follow my word? Why, why do you say that you're a follower? Why do you say that you're a Christian when you, you don't follow the scripture? You don't follow the preaching? You, you don't obey what I'm speaking to your heart? When I convict you on Sunday or I convict you on Wednesday, I speak to you throughout the week. You, you don't listen to me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I command? You cannot be a follower of Jesus without actually following him. Luke 14, beginning with verse 16. Then Jesus said unto him, A certain man, a certain man made a great supper, and he invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were invited, Come. For all things are now ready. Let me stop here. When you get the invitation that dinner is ready, the doors aren't instantly closed. No, no, no. The the doors stay open because many were invited and we're waiting for the guest. We're we're expecting the guest to come. We don't ring the dinner bell anymore, but growing up as a kid in a house with three boys, mom would say to one of the boys, go tell your brothers dinner's ready. Let me tell you what we did. Dinner's ready. We just yell it across the yard or the house or wherever. Mom didn't immediately put the food up when she announced that dinner was ready. She didn't close the kitchen door because you weren't in there. No, when when the invitation went out, the doors were left open. There's still time to come. The invitation was extended, letting you know now is the time to come. The reason I'm stopping here this morning is that you've been given an invitation. I, I, I hope you know that I don't have to preach this part of it. That he's speaking about this certain man being God. Who's throwing a great feast and you've been invited. And now the opportunity to seize that is today. The doors are still open. You've still got breath in your body. You've got an opportunity. There will be people whose names will be in the paper tomorrow in the obituary section that had no idea when they woke up this morning that this would be the last opportunity. I pray it's not you. And he sent his servant at supper time. To say to them that were invited, come. He sent his servant. He sent his preachers. He sent his Sunday school teachers. He sent the evangelists. He he, he sent the missionaries. He he sent the men's director, the women's director. He, He sent people into your life to let you know the invitation has been extended. Come. For many of us, we've gotten more than one invitation from God. Look at this, it says in verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must need go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Skip down to verse 24. 
For I say to you that none of these men which were invited shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower, sit not down first and count the cost, whether he is sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king doesn't sit down first and count the cost, consult whether or not he's able with 10,000 to meet him that come against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsake not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. A certain man made a great supper and invited many. This invitation should have been cherished. This invitation should have been prized as valuable. Let me give you an illustration. If any one of us were to have received an invitation from the White House to come and eat dinner with the president, if you didn't, whether you voted or not, I'm convinced that most of us aren't quite as political as we like to put on the front. If they didn't require you to give it to them at the door, I believe most of us would probably frame that invitation or put it in, in, in some place of prominence. Because we, we value the invitation. It means something. We, if you had been given that invitation, I, I imagine that it would go something like this for some of you. Pastor Mark, we won't be here Sunday. We, we got invited to eat dinner at the White House. You understand. And I would. So yeah, we, we're going to leave Friday. I took off work early because we don't want to be late. I already got a hotel. I know it's going to be Sunday afternoon, but Pastor, we, we want to be there and enjoy it. I understand. You, you'd make a commitment to that because you, you value the invitation. The Bible says they began to make excuse when they had been given an invitation. They began to make excuse. They made excuse, I believe, for two reasons. One of the reasons is because they were afraid that if they accepted that commitment, if they accepted that invitation, it would cost them some of the other opportunities that they had before them. If I say yes to this invitation, then, then I might have to say no to something else. Well, that's just lies. But when that invitation loses its value, then it's easy to say no to that. If you had that invitation for the White House at supper, you probably would leave early. And if it was on a Friday night, I'm sure you'd probably sign your children out early, maybe even on Thursday, so you can get there in plenty of time. You'd move whatever you had to move in your schedule to make that a priority because of the value of the invitation. You hear me this morning. You've been given an invitation from the King of Kings. The president, whoever he may be, whether it's this season, a past president, or even a future president, or any other world leader, local leader, or even church member, the Bible says one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. 
It's amazing to me that our commitment would shift at the value of the invitation from the governor's mansion or the White House. And yet you and I acknowledge that we have an invitation, a personal invitation from the King of Kings. That the president one day will bow his knee and say, you thought I was somebody, but he's, he's everybody. And you were given that invitation and it lost its value. Holy Spirit, speak this morning. Some of you, you've allowed that invitation. You ever, you ever put a piece of mail on the counter someplace and it just got lost in the shuffle? I've discovered that that happens often with bills, but not so often with checks. I've discovered things that we place value on don't get lost in the shuffle so easily. You hear this preacher's heart this morning. God's been all over me for your soul. Some of us, we've allowed the invitation that God's given at one time when we initially received it. The day that we surrendered our life, we acknowledged the value of it. We were willing to move our whole life schedule and everything in life around that invitation. But somewhere in the busyness of life, the invitation's lost its value. And it doesn't motivate you like it once did. And God sent messengers. Here here I am today. I believe that God's given you yet another invitation. I know you were careless and you you misplaced the last one. You let the fire burn out. but, But here's another because I've set a place for you at the table. I invited you. The doors are still open. I'm waiting for you to come. I don't want to invite another to sit in your place. I invited you because I love you. And they all began to make excuse. One one said, I've I've bought some land and I've got to go look at it. Do Do you have to go today? Couldn't you go tomorrow? I've, I've given you an invitation. I, I had planned to meet with you today. I, I invited you so long ago, but you, you're going to look at the land today? Another says to him, well, I've bought, I bought five ox, and I've got to test drive them. I've got to prove them. Today, can't can't you go tomorrow? Does it does it have to be today? I, I've prepared a meal. Everything's ready. I invited you, but you you chose you chose other things. Let me tell you what it looks like. The first was I bought a piece of land. My material possessions. I've got to tend to these things. God, you, you know. Jesus, you know that I love you. But I've got so much to do. I've got to, I've got to clean. I've got to cook. And I've got to do all these things. And this thing grabbed a hold of my heart this morning. That some of us... We spend hours every week cleaning the house, cleaning the car, detailing the boat. And the house is clean, but the temple is still filthy. Pastor, I would read my Bible. Pastor, I would would be in church more. I just don't have time, but you do have time. But the invitation you've been given doesn't have the same value as the other things in your life. And so it gets buried in the mix of life. And and sometimes when it's convenient, we stumble upon it and we show up. See, the other said, I've bought five oxen. I've got to go try them out. Pastor Mark, you know, we got this new boat. Man, you ought to see it. Let me show you the pictures of it. 
That's why we wasn't at church Sunday. Why? Well, you know, the kids, everybody was excited. We bought that thing Friday, couldn't wait to get it in the water. That's the only day we had for family. You understand? It doesn't matter whether I understand. I wonder how God feels about it. I gave, I gave you an invitation. Could, could, couldn't you go Monday? And I have to work Monday. So you, you called out on me. Well, God, I've only got so much vacation. I, I know. The, invita <laughs> the invitation that God gave you was written in blood. The other man said, I, I just got married. I can't, I can't come. Can, can you not bring her with you? Nobody said you couldn't bring her to church with you. Let me be real with you. God has blessed you and given you seven days in every week. And God has given you 24 hours in every one of those days. And the reality is that we scarcely lay aside a day to give God. L let, me, let me just be real. We, we aren't even close to giving God a day. I don't know too many Christians that would settle or tolerate that. We wrestle and stumble over giving God more than an hour. The truth is there are people that don't come to this church because I won't get them out of here by noon, guaranteed. I don't make apology for that. My feelings on that are this. If, if you don't enjoy being in God's presence and in God's house beyond an hour, then you're probably going to be miserable in heaven anyway. God said, I've given you an invitation and, and, and you've, you've whittled the time that you've allotted, that you've allotted to me. I've allotted seven days in every week, 24 hours in every day. I've allotted that to you. And you've whittled it down in your own heart that I'm worthy of a measly hour. Lexington Church of God, maybe an hour and a half. Tell me again why you can't come to Sunday school. I've given you an invitation. Well, God, I'd have to get up early. Yeah. Like when you go to that Black Friday sale. Oh, no, no, you wouldn't have to get up that early, would you? Like when you go hunting. No, no, I wouldn't get up that early to come to church. I uh, see. But if you're going to make your tea time, you better get there early. Can, can you not do that tomorrow? <laughs> I invited you. I expected that you would be there, but They all began to make excuse. If, if, if you're a good Christian in this nation, we've, we've reduced Christianity to look something like what I'm about to lay out to you. To give God, if we, if we go to Sunday school, give God maybe two hours on a Sunday morning. Give Him another hour on a Sunday night. And one more hour on a Wednesday because we're good Christians. Make a commitment to discipleship. We've whittled it down to about four hours a week. There's a reason we've never had to do two services on Wednesday. I'm just saying. That invitation doesn't mean anything. It's just one more church service. Just Listen. 
they began to make excuses. I've discovered that most people don't reject the invitation God gives them because they're entrenched in sin. Most people simply don't in, accept the invitation God's given them because they're busy. They're not evil people. They're not bad people. I'm talking about church people. They simply don't accept the invitation God's given them to go deeper, to know Him more intimately. Hear me this morning. You are as close right now. You are as close to God as you have chosen to be. You are as close to God right now as you want to be. You, you, could, be, you could be closer to God. You could know Him more intimately, but you, you haven't. You've made all the excuses and whatever it is that helps you get comfortable. But at the end of the day, it's just that. Most people simply decline the invitation God's given them because they're just so involved in the everyday affairs, running life, too busy to think too seriously about spiritual things. There's an excuse for anything that you're looking for an excuse for, but at the end of the day, it is genuinely just that, an excuse. D.L. Moody said this, Excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men to sleep in. Excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men to sleep in. It reminded me of a, an illustration that I had read or heard years ago about how to boil a frog. I just let them live because I don't like frog legs that much. They say, if you want them fresh, you you, you got to put that frog in alive. I don't know if that's true or not, but it makes sense that if you, if you have the water boiling and you put that live frog in there, he's going to jump out because it's too hot. Well, I do the same thing. So what you got to do is put him in at room temperature. Just slowly turn the heat up. He'll get so comfortable in that warm water, it'll feel like a hot tub. He'll think he's in the jacuzzi when the bubbles start going off, never even realizing that the flames are cooking him alive. Let me tell you this morning, some of you don't realize the devil has lulled you to sleep in your own excuse. You got so comfortable being there that you've used that excuse for so long. Hey, I've got a demanding job. I've got family priorities and obligations, and you've got all these things you don't even realize. The flames of hell are burning already, and the devil's already started cranking the heat up, but you're comfortable. Because he knew that if he'd confronted any one of you and said, deny Jesus today, you'd jump out of that. But instead, you've denied the invitation that he's given him, that he's given you one moment at a time, one day at a time, one opportunity at a time. The Bible said there was multitudes of people following Jesus in that crowd. Multitudes and Jesus stopped in the middle of it. You, you, would, you would think that he would have been excited that there were so many people there. That, that he would have just been glad that there were so many people that were attracted to him and it was an opportunity to reach him, but not at all. He's more concerned with their eternity than he is the attendance, he's more concerned with their commitment than he is their attendance. It's quite contrary to what we see in most churches today. Who will bargain, we're, we're bargain shopping the gospel. If we can fill the building up, what will it take to get them back next week? Maybe, maybe if we don't bring the word, if we just water it down just a little bit, we can pack a pew next Sunday too. We compromise, we, we're so worried about filling up seats. There's churches that'll they'll hire people to sing songs, hire musicians and, and hire band members and, and sacrifice true praise. We're so small in this nation that many of us don't even know how to worship when we're out there if these folks out here won't do a good job. They have nothing to do with your worship. You choose, you choose whether or not you'll give God glory and honor. If they miss every note and they butcher every key. I 
love hearing little children sing. Technically, they stink. <laughs> you got one just belting it out. And he's made up his own note. Doesn't even exist. It's a genius like that. Three or four of them twirling around in circles. And every once in a while when they know these two words in, in sequence, they'll shout those two words real loud and proud. The reason we put those little kids on stage because it, man, it does something to my heart. When I see my children, and they were little, oh man, you want to talk about something that melt daddy's heart. My oldest sings up here, if I'm not careful, it'll break me down in tears to see her worshiping God. I wonder, I wonder how God feels. When we just get lost in worship, these little children, you want to know why I love children when they worship? Because they're not trying to put on a show. They're too naive and innocent for that. They're just giving God their best. They don't care what you think about it. And we get so focused on whether or not it's technically good. If it's not, after all, then it's not worthy to offer God. And Jesus said this to his own disciples. Suffer the little children to come to me. For such is the kingdom of God. You've been given an invitation. Jesus looks at the whole crowd. Not concerned with how many people will be here next Sunday. He says to the whole crowd, he said, I'm telling you the truth. Unless a man hates his mother and his father and his brother and his sister and his own children, he cannot be my disciple. Hate. But, but I thought you said that we're to honor our mother and father. I, I thought you, were, you said, Lord, that, that we're not only to love our brother and sister, but we're to love our enemies. Now you're saying I'm to hate them. If you're asking that of me, it's too much. I can't hate my children. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that every other relationship in your life will pale in comparison to the point that it looks like hate compared to the relationship that you have with me. Unless you're ready. Listen, let me just be real with you. The way that looks is this. If there's any relationship in your life today that if it were to create conflict in your house for you to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, who would win? He said, because if you're not to that point where I'm going to win every time, then you can't. You, you, you're not following me. You're not my disciple. You're not a Christian. You've been given the invitation. You say, yeah, but they got their last, their last tournaments this weekend, Pastor. Don't tell me. You were given an invitation, and right now the door's open. And you're no fool. You've seen in the obituary section that there's not a certain age that you have to be before death knocks on your door. The door's open today and you've been given an invitation. But you... And our excuse is just as lame as those. You're going to look at land. Can't you go tomorrow? Couldn't you have went yesterday? Can't you go after the... Sure you could. Well, no, I can't with the tournament. It's, you should have never signed up. Because you're taking your children to the same place that you're choosing. And you're showing them that the invitation God's given is not really as important as the ball game. Pastor, that's just one thing. It'll be over soon. Okay, so, Junior, God's number one. Unless this one thing comes up, then put him number two. He understands. He's only number two to this one thing. I wonder how he feels about that. Pastor, I don't, it's not like that. But no, but it is, it's exactly like that. My heart has been heavy and grieving this morning because I realized the message God put on my heart wasn't something that I was going to get a lot of shouting for. But just as Jesus confronted that crowd, he did so because he was more concerned with their eternity than he was their attendance. 
I want to see you grow. I want to see you know God. I want to see you accept the invitation. Let me ask you a very serious question this morning. Do you believe the word of God? I mean, do you really believe it? Because, because the answer to that question will dictate and determine every decision you make in life. Do you honestly believe that God's word is truth? Do you believe that what God said in here, he plans to do? Let me read for you something then. Luke 14, verse 24. He said, I say to you that none of these men which were invited shall taste of my supper. You were invited, but you made an excuse. And when the doors closed, don't think for a second that any of those that denied the invitational partake in the supper. My heart is heavy this morning because. Because there has been a real care and concern in my heart and a passion for souls since the moment I got saved. God gripped my heart with the scripture. Said on that day not everyone that says to me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. He said many will say on that day Lord didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these great things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. My heart is heavy this morning because I'm afraid that some, even some in this church, if God were to come back today, you'd die and you'd be tormented in hell for all eternity. And nobody wants to hear a preacher preach on hell. Because it's scary. And the most comfortable thing for a man to do would be to tickle your ears and tell you something you want to hear because then you might come back next Sunday. But it would be the most inhumane, the most cruel thing any man could do. I'm telling you the truth if, if you're not to the place where your relationship with me is above and superior to every relationship in your life you're not following me and you say you believe in God's word I'm just read for you what God's word said he said none of those that were bidden will taste of my supper they didn't want to follow me they wanted to follow their own path they wanted to do life their own way I didn't barter with you when I gave my life for you. I didn't barter with the devil when I gave my life for you. God's not ready to barter for you now. Salvation is freely given, but discipleship will cost you everything. He said, I'm telling you the truth. Unless a man takes up his cross... And follows me, he cannot be my disciple. We have so distorted, perverted, and gotten so accustomed to the cross today that we've, we've allowed it to lose significance in our own heart. The cross is a symbol of death. I know we know that up here. But we've seen it and looked at it for so long, it's lost significance in our mind it's lost the significance in our heart we wear it around our neck and out here don't don't misunderstand i'm not against jewelry and i'm not against crosses but it's become so commonplace that we forget that the cross is a symbol of death Let me give you a real example just to prove my point. When's the last time you walked into a jewelry store and you said, Oh my gosh, that is a beautiful electric chair. Is that, that diamond studded too? My husband has this beautiful necklace. I think he would love to have one of those. 
Brother, where'd you get that electric chair you're wearing? That's, that's gorgeous. We're repulsed by such an idea. Who would, who would wear that around their neck? Pastor, that, that's a symbol of death. Do you know how many people die in that? That's exactly the meaning of the cross. I'm not anti-cross. I'm not anti-you wearing them. I'm just telling you, it's become so commonplace that we look at it and just think it's a symbol of beauty. It's a charm to be worn around our necks. Look around you at the people you see at the ball field or in the grocery store. They don't look anything like Jesus Christ, and they'll have one of them hanging around their neck. Have them on their back bumper and do things that followers of Jesus wouldn't do. He said, I'm telling you the truth, unless you're ready to take up your cross, the cross is a symbol of death. What the cross meant, Paul said it like this. Paul understood what it meant. He said, even though I'm alive, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. Whatever I am today, I am because of Jesus Christ living in me. What the cross really means, it's a symbol of death. If any man saw another man toting a cross, he knew that that man was a dead man walking. Oh, he might be alive for now, but he's on his way to death. He doesn't have a future in front of him. What I'm telling you scripturally, what God is saying, until you're to the point where all of your ambitions have died, that you're dead men and dead women walking, that yes, I have a life, but the life I have is not my own. I live to glorify God. That's where I'm at. I want to be like that, like Paul was, where I don't have ambition. Yes, I had them in my mind, but I've sold out to those. I've given up my 401k. I've sold out to Jesus Christ. I've given up my opportunity to pursue a career out in the world because God had called me to do something different and I'm sold out to Jesus Christ. Until and unless you're ready to say that God, my relationship with you supersedes any relationship in this world, God. My relationship with you is more valuable to me than my own life, than anything that I could have in this world. I'd rather have you. Oh, we sing some cute songs about it. Oh, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. And for most of us, that's a bald-faced lie. We sing it in church as though it means something. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And many of us in here, we sell him out every week for a little casual conversation at the water cooler when we had an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. We sold it out to be popular. To be funny. There's some empty seats beside you this morning because some sold him out for a few more moments of sleep. He could have been here. They were invited. I'm getting ready to close. Talk about the relationships this morning. Is there any relationship in your life today that if it were to challenge your relationship with Jesus Christ, it would win over the Lord? My husband don't like me coming to church, Pastor Mark. That's why I'm not able to come often. The scripture gives you some counsel on that. It says if they're not a believer, whether it's a husband or wife, it doesn't matter, works both ways. He said you live a faithful life in front of them. And that God may use that to sanctify them and sanctify your whole household. Maybe if you'd walk the walk and not just talk that talk. I thought about this morning. Most of us, we will never, most likely never have to. Lay our life down physically for Jesus. Most of us will probably never be put on the spot and asked to choose between God and our children or God and our spouse. And I thought about a, a story that I'd heard that I believe was from China eight or ten years ago, maybe longer. And there was a group of Christians that had been found. And the government, they brought them out and brought them out into the street and publicly began to harass them, abuse them, physically assault them. 
Tell them if they didn't deny God, they'd continue to beat him. When they didn't deny God, it got more intense. And they pulled the men aside, put them before a firing squad, and began to tell them, if you don't deny God, we're going to kill you. They looked at the women and said, if, if you don't deny God, we're going to kill your husbands. To their little children, they said, if you don't deny, not a one of them denied them. And true to their word, they executed the men in front of their wives. They executed the father in front of their children. And then they began to press and put the attention on the moms. And feeling frustrated that they probably wouldn't get them to bend either. They took a more extreme measure and they brought an asphalt steamroller. Laid their babies down on the ground in front of that thing and began to tell those mothers... If you don't deny God, your babies will die. They didn't deny God. Instead, these women banded together and they started singing Christian hymns. I can't imagine. And as they were singing these Christian hymns, they were encouraging the children that everything was going to be all right. That they would be in paradise with Jesus. And true to their word, they executed those little babies in front of their mother. I think who in their right mind would make such a decision? Let me tell you who it's the one that believes in this word. Because they knew that was the only decision that would matter. I asked you earlier, do you believe what's in this word? Because it will dictate and determine every decision that you make. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What would it have benefited them that day to deny Jesus Christ just so their children could live in bodily form but deny God and die and burn in hell for all eternity? No, they made the only decision that made any sense at all. See, the Bible says, though a man die, yet he'll live. See, I believe that this word is true. I, I believe we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. That there was a man, Jesus Christ, that died, really, literally, physically died a, a, a death. And yet he, he's very much alive. Three days later, the Bible lets us know that first fruit. He, he's very much alive. The grave couldn't contain him. That death wasn't the end. Death was just the beginning. This is what I'm telling you this morning. You've been given an invitation, and most likely... Not a person in this room will ever know anything, anything remotely close to that type of sacrifice. And the sad and sobering truth is that most of us in this room balk and stumble over the idea of giving God a little bit more, whether it's our time or stuff. I'm closing, but I began to think this morning. We're full of excuses for why we can't come for Wednesday night. Why we can't come for Sunday school. Why we're not as faithful as we want to be. You're as faithful as you want to be right now. On the I want to be more faithful. You, you choose. You don't understand what that would cost. I know I may not understand what it'll cost, but I do know you choose. And it hit me. Consider for a moment how much we invest and give to our hobbies. How much time and energy and money we spend on going to the races, going to the movies even. How much we spend bowling and golfing, hunting, fishing, shopping, cleaning the house, taking care of the yard. Pastor, I've got to do all those things. Yep, I'm asking you to make a commitment to the Word of God. To make a commitment to discipleship. So you say I only had 24 hours today. And the grass didn't get cut. I apologize to all my neighbors. 
but my soul had to get fed. I began to think how much we invest in kids' sports. Goodness, how much, how much we invest going out to eat. And yet we stumble every time the preacher mentions tithe. We stumble over the idea that somebody would be audacious enough to suggest that I give more of my time to God. And my daughter's 20 years old, engaged. That means they're talking about getting married. She's planning, just lightly at this point. Unbeknownst to her, I'm planning to. I've already figured out it's going to cost me. And I'm okay with it. It's an investment I'm willing to make because of the commitment I have to that relationship. The Bible says there's a wedding you're not just invited, you are the bride, dear friend. It already cost him. And it was a price he was willing to pay. Because he made a commitment to you. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. He's committed to you. You've got an invitation. Stand with me all over the house. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The truth is, life gets busy very quickly. And that commitment that you made a long time ago, if you meant it, God's bringing it back to the forefront of your mind. What God's doing is giving you another invitation. Spiritually, you misplaced the other one. You misprioritized it. Life has gotten busy and things have gotten out of order. But the doors aren't closed. The invitation's still there. And He sent His servants to bid them, to beckon to them, to call for them who were invited to come. These altars are open. You can pray at your seats, but I'm inviting you this morning to come. To make a commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ. God, I want to know you more intimately. To make a commitment to be involved in Sunday school. To make a commitment to be here on Wednesday night. You can God, I get off late. I know, but I've given you an invitation. Would you, would you come? I, I, you can rest. You can rest a little later. You stay up late and you watch the fight and you'll stay up late and you'll watch the game and you'll stay up late to do anything that you want to do. The Holy Spirit's breaking my heart this morning. Some of you. God's invited and God's done so many things in your life and in your family. And He's touched your marriage. Not only did He die to save your soul, He has blessed you in more ways than you can count. And the reality is you are far from faithful. You have the title Christian, but you're a bargain shopper. And you've gotten so comfortable in your own excuses that it doesn't even bother you anymore except for a time like this where God's given that invitation again and it's pricking your heart. 
Don't you see, dear friend, God saying, my heart is broken over you. He's crazy about you to the point of laying his life down for you. And you won't even come to visit. When you do your mind and your heart, your thoughts are elsewhere. All over this house, worship with us this morning. And I want to ask you, would you find you a spot and pray? God, I want to reaffirm my commitment to you. I know that you want more from me. I know you want more for me. I know that I could be closer, God. I don't want to make excuses any longer, God. I don't want to be so distracted by the things of this world, those things that don't even matter. Help me to make you a priority in my life. Would you worship with us this morning? I am the Lord God, your Father. I am a jealous God. You've chosen many things. Strange fire you've lifted up to me. You've given yourself as the harlot to so many things of this world. And I've pursued you and I've chased you down. I've redeemed you. And I've bought you unto myself. Behold, I have given you life. I have covered you in righteousness. You are mine, says the Lord. Come home, my child. Hallelujah.